Hello, welcome to Living Hope, where there's always hope with God. Sorry, we've had a lot of issues with this camera uh, the last few days, and it went right to my personal page instead of the church page. So that's why I'm rebooting and restarting. We're going to be in the book of Romans today, and um, we're going to be uh, looking at a deeper theology uh, in Romans than we normally see in some of the other books. Uh, he deals with the purpose behind things more than just the action. Uh, Romans has um, a lot of revelation to it, not like the book of Revelation, but a lot of spiritual insight to the book of Romans. And um, to me, it's one of my favorite books because of the theology, the, the deeper truths that we see coming out of this book um, it's encouraging to go through books and to study together because we're developing deeper, deeper understanding and we're encouraging others with this knowledge. Um, it's so important that we uh, see this and, and get established in it and, and make sure that uh, we're growing in the revelation and the nature of God. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 1. Let me get this up and running here. Romans chapter 1. I don't know why I can't get this. Hold on just a second, we'll get started. Romans chapter 1. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We bless you for this day and this opportunity to go through your word. May your word uh, be hidden in our hearts that we would not sin against you. May you continue to inspire us and transform us. May our lives be continually changed by um, the word, the truth, and the light of the gospel. We pray, God, that you would um, just help us walk in your anointing that this understanding would bring great um, blessing into our life, great stability. And as we come to know you deeper and, and uh, come to understand you better, may it change how we see ourselves. May you be glorified in this day in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to be in Romans chapter 1. And uh, here we go. Verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scripture, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop right there and cover a few things. First of all, Paul states 
in this opening address that he's a bond servant, that he's a bond servant of God. And so in being a bond servant of God, um, it's a willing, cho willing choice to serve God. A bond servant in those in, in Scripture is one who was a slave, and when he was called to be set free, recognized that he was better in the master's house. And so they would take and against the door they would pierce his ears, his ear. I believe it's his right ear, and they would put. Um, a stone in there and it would be a symbol of his willingness to serve underneath the master it was a willing choice well paul states that he is serving jesus christ because he recognizes that his masters being with his master is far greater than being out on his own and so he says i am a bond servant of jesus christ called to be an apostle the word apostle means uh one who is sent so Paul was called to go out and preach and declare God's truth among the Gentiles. And in doing so, we can see um, the effectiveness that God uh, used Paul to reach so many people. And as, uh, as an apostle, Paul is declaring and revealing God's truth in the gospel to all. Now, Paul was sent to the Gentiles. Um, I would say uh, the majority of his work was sent to the Gentiles, but it didn't, did not mean that he did not reach Jews as well. And we see that call. So with that, he goes on to the next, which God had promised through the prophets where? Where was God's promise found? In the Holy Scriptures. God's promise of the revelation of Jesus Christ was through the prophets pinned down in the Holy Scriptures. And that's what Peter says, that men wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's interesting because these men and in, in, in these prophets did not understand completely the things that they were writing. But as they wrote them and, and it was pinned down, years later we discovered the prophetic nature of some of these scriptures in revealing Jesus Christ in detail in his works. Oof. So it's amazing to see the prophetic nature of the Old Testament and the fulfillment of the New Testament. Paul declaring that Jesus, who was born of the seed of David, it's important because the Messiah would come through David's line and declare to be the Son of God according to the Spirit of Holiness by the resurrection of the dead. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then there's a lack of uh, declaration. There would no be, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we would not be able to state that he is the son of God. He would just be a man. And so that is huge to recognize that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, in doing so, it uh, reveals the truth of God and, uh, when Jesus rise from the dead, well, who can rise from the dead? Well, Jesus said he would raise himself and only the son of God could declare that. So there's so much here that we see in this uh, declaration and it reveals so much to us uh, of the gospel message that Jesus Christ came and lived as a man, uh, performed signs, miracles, and wonders who was according whose um, genealogy is in the line of David. And he was declared by signs, miracles, and wonders to be, this, to be uh, a man of God, to be uh, a man full of power and, and full of the Holy Spirit. And then now he states, now he states that, uh, that Jesus is the Son of God based on what? The the reality of the resurrection. Let's go on. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Let's, let's go into that and then I'll uh, look at some of the responses in here. Why are we called? Well, we're called 
of Jesus to glorify his name and represent him to the world. Jesus is not here physically, but the Holy Spirit is, and he's using our lives physically to be a witness. We have received grace and apostleship. Once again, apostleship has to do with being sent out. Grace is a gift of God. What is that grace for, and why, why, are, we be, why are we being sent out? To show obedience to the faith. Come on. Our lives are to show obedience to the faith, obedience to the commandments, obedience to grace. Now, here's, here's the important part of this. Grace is for obedience. So this process has a specific order and is represented in this passage. Ready? We first receive grace. And grace empowers us to obedience and as we follow through with obedience there's more grace to empower obedience now here's the wrong order we obey so we can get grace we obey to get grace then grace wouldn't be a gift in that order grace would be a work and grace would be a reward for works hmm no, we first get grace as a gift and it empowers work. It empowers obedience. Lord, let our lives be an open Bible for all to read, leading them to you. Amen. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians 3 that says that we are epistles written not with ink, but written with the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit marks out our lives, we are the book that people can read. So that statement, I can read you like a book. They need to read us at, like the Bible. Our lives need to be that open and reflect the truth of God's word. So once again, let's look at the order here. Grace for obedience. Grace and apostleship for obedience. Not obedience for grace. In doing so, it reflects that grace is the empowerment for obedience that we don't obey or we don't work to get grace, which lines up with Ephesians chapter two. We don't work for grace. Grace is a gift and the response of grace is obedience. It's to empower us to obey God. This truth and this order will change people. It sets us free. And it also sets us free from disappointment for if we work and we don't get grace as a, as a response of work, then it, we're disappointed and then we begin to condemn ourselves. But if we work because we've already received grace, then we can work from a place of thanksgiving and we don't suffer the same kind of disappointment or even condemnation that the enemy throws on us. Come on, church. So look at this order. If this order is correct, then it should allow us freedom in our service. So, what, what, does, what does receiving grace look like? Let's ask that question. What does receiving grace look like? What does receiving grace look like? And I'll give you one answer. Receiving grace looks like in my life that I'm forgiving others. Ooh, you mean forgiving others is response or empowered by God's grace? Absolutely. What does receiving grace look like to you? But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Amen. You see the important order here? What does grace look like to you? It's according to Christ's gift. It's not according to our work. Good morning. So what does grace look like to you? What does receiving grace look like to you? I mentioned it, it, it in my life, it looks like that I'm 
willing or working on forgiving others constantly. Notice I said working on it. It's not a finished work all the time, is it? <laughs> what does receiving grace look like to you? Grace looks to me like forgiving others. Freely I have been forgiven. Amen. Amen. Grace also looks like loving others. Receiving grace will empower you to love other people. Mm. It looks like what, God, what can be attained only by God, impossible by me. Amen. Amen. So receiving grace will empower love. Grace looks like having more patience with those who are hard on the ears. Ooh, ooh. Amen. Amen. What else does grace look like? How do, how do we know somebody's received grace? Or how do we, what does receiving grace look like to us? Um, it gives us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Receiving grace gives us a hunger and thirst for righteousness. It also gives us a power or a desire for spiritual gifts and opens us up to be used in spiritual gifts. Grace looks like praying his victory in worship over every trial and difficulty. Amen. And we begin to pray for Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. we begin to pray and praise from a place of victory even if we don't have it yet in, in, in our present reality we begin to praise and pray from a place of victory even if we don't have it in our present reality because grace says that we will mm. and we have already have everything we need ooh, that's good man what else does grace look like? We'll take a few moments and, and answer that before moving on. And I don't, have, I don't have a set desire to get through all of Romans 1 today because there's so much here. But what else does grace look like? What, 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 does, grace, what does receiving grace look like to us? Grace looks like continually interceding on the behalf of others, continually interceding, even when you're praying and praying and praying and don't see results in them. Once again, if you're looking for results based on your action, it's not grace. Oh, that's a good term. If we're looking for results based on our action, it's not grace, it's work. If we're looking results based on Christ's action, then, and, and all we're doing is being obedient to pray for that person, then we don't need results. Uh, we don't need to see results to define our action. Ooh, that's good. Grace reveals itself in, let's see. Grace reveals itself in the power of the spiritual gifts at work, amen. Grace looks like surrender and obedience. Amen. So once again, this order is so important. We receive grace for obedience. We don't start out in obedience to receive grace. That would make it an action of work rather than an action of worship. All right, let's go on. Verse 7. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. And I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to address a couple of statements because I know they come in. We have a little bit of delay for those who are watching. But uh, I'm going to hammer verse 7 real quick. Um, beautiful, peaceful, enabling us to get out of the basic concepts, the freedom to move to greater works than selfishness. Amen. Grace empowers, um, empowers a selfless life. All right. Verse 7, once again, I need to read this. 
To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Called to be what? Saints. We don't call ourselves saints. We were called to be saints by the work of Jesus Christ. Who is a saint? It's not specific people that have done great works. It's all those who have received Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. You and I are called saints by God. Blameless, righteous people. We don't call ourselves that. God calls us that. And it's not for a select few that have done great works. It's for every believer. And that is an understanding that we need to have. And we need to remind ourselves who we are. This is one of those things that gives us identity. We are saints. You and I are saints by the work of God, by the work of Jesus Christ. We were called that. We don't call ourselves that. No one else has placed us in this position. God places us in this position. Think of the freedom there is in that. God puts us in that position. We are now saints. Grace gives us sainthood. Mm. Receiving Christ gives us sainthood. Wow. How important is that to our lives? To discover that God has called us to be saints. To see the reality of that. Question, Romans 111, how does Paul impart spiritual gifts? When I get there, we'll discuss the, that, okay? So, let's move on. First of all, I thank God through our Lord Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests if by some means now at last I might find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. Okay, so here's what I see. Paul is stating that he constantly prays for the, this church. This church's faith is spoken about throughout the whole known world. And now when Paul is able to come see them, he may impart to them some spiritual gift and that the working of the spiritual gift may be able to encourage Paul and build up his faith at the same time. What, how would Paul... How would Paul impart spiritual gifts through the laying on of hands and asking God for that revelation of spiritual gifts. So as we pray over one another, we lay hands on one another and we set the focus on what the Holy Spirit can do in spiritual gifts, maybe those gifts would be imparted. Now Paul doesn't have the power himself to impart the gift but Paul is setting time for the Holy Spirit and focus for the Holy Spirit to impart the gift. And this is what I love about this passage, and it's been coming up a lot in our small groups, that through the sharing of faith and the working of spiritual gifts, that we all may grow in the faith. So Paul is going to grow as a result of their activity in the Lord. That's huge. That's why... I like the idea of the church being like a support group, a spiritual support group, a Bible support group. Some people have trouble with that word, but I think it's a still a powerful term that we are supporting each other in the work and we're all growing from one another. And that's what I love about the Apostle Paul. Think about it. He wrote most of the New Testament and he had, he had all this great profound wisdom and knowledge and he wanted to go to Rome to share in spiritual gifts and, and the return of those gifts back to him so that God would be glorified and they all can grow together. Oof. Wow, I've been, 
I've never asked God to impart spiritual gifts upon others in prayer. That's awesome. Now I must do. Absolutely. Lord, that's why we lay hands on people, anoint them with oil. Lord, impart to them a spiritual gift. Impart to them um, a spiritual fruit. And as that fruit and that gift is displayed, it comes back to us and we all grow together. Um, this is why it's been coming up a lot. This very activity in the small groups, the way we're seeing it, is that yes, you have somebody that is kind of facilitating, but because everybody else can participate, you know how much that person that's facilitating gets in return? You know what's stirred up in that group activity? Amazing things. And that's what Paul is stating here. 1 Timothy 5.22, I believe Paul had great dis discretion in knowing those who would use the gifts in a proper mind and spirit. He never laid hands on hastily. Absolutely not. And, and one of the other reasons laying on hands is also for leadership. So Paul wouldn't put people in leadership hastily. And that goes along with the whole context of 1 Timothy 5. But should we ask God to empower them with spiritual gifts? I believe so. We pray over them and, and we ask God to give them the best gifts. Hastily really would also apply to ministry. Paul goes on to state in 1 Timothy 3 that we don't want novices in the position of leadership because there's no experience and the devil can twist things up. But in the laying on of hands to impart spiritual gifts and to see those things go, I believe that that call is open to all. Now, we want to use discretion in making sure that when the, those activities take place, there is people of experience. And that's why Paul states in 1 Corinthians 14 that the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets so that there can be um, guidance. But I believe everybody has spiritual gifts. And as Paul was going, he had the maturity that they can operate in those spiritual gifts. It was going to stir up Paul as well in the process. Does that make sense? And, and I think this, this idea with the spiritual gifts is huge. The best gifts... And the wisdom to use them according to your will. Teach them to hear your voice so that they may partner with you and not work. Ooh, yes, Amy. That's exactly the whole point. So with the exercise of spiritual gifts, God wants guidance. It's not that we're free just to do whatever we want. We're led by the Holy Spirit that will use others to help guide us and that we will help guide them. And all of us are functioning in a specific order for the benefit of all. Woo, that's good. Amen. Discernment and time of testing before placing somebody in leadership. Amen. But how, how can you, like, what are you observing to place somebody in leadership? Are you observing potential or are you observing activity? I mean, activity is in already doing the work that they should lead others into. And I think, and this is the way I see scripture in first timothy that that we're observing activity people who are already doing the work and then placing them in leadership based on their experience rather than placing them in leadership just for potential and how are we going to observe them if there's no activity come on and that's what amy's describing here so paul is going there and he's setting up this church to function in the spirit and that they can stir each other up with spiritual activities. And Paul is there to help guide them. And in the process, he's getting blessed in return. He's part of it. They're sharing together. That is the whole point. And if we don't see activity, if we don't see people start, then how are we ever going to place people in positions? Not positions as in superior, but positions of leadership. And I think this is where we're seeing the reality of this scripture take place. Look at the fruit in that. This is huge. And what the church in America has primarily done, and the modern church has primarily done, 
is that we haven't stirred, got the people functioning in activity. We just got the leadership trying to do it all. And people looking at the leadership to do it all. Um, in Ephesians 4, it says that the leadership is there to get the people and help encourage the people and guide the people to do the work of the ministry. Also, there's a man, you know, who writes a lot of books, and a lot of people would know him. His name's Francis Chan. Well, he left what we would call like a mega church to go back into home groups because everybody in the mega church was looking for him to do their spiritual work for them. I believe that when God wants to place someone in leadership, our leaders will know in their spirit, God will speak clearly and confirm by unfolding circumstances and situations that reveal the work he is calling them to do. Greater benefit of all. Amen. That's exactly what it's like. So we recognize what God is doing, that somebody's already starting doing the work. People recognize it. And we come together and look at it and see you know, if we believe in unity, that the Holy Spirit is calling them up for that position. But I think we oftentimes look at it like this, and we're missing the point, that I see potential in somebody, and we're calling them up in position, and maybe they'll fulfill that position by their potential, and oftentimes it doesn't happen. Romans 1 tells me the firmest foundation we have in Jesus Firm enough for all of us to stand on forever in every piece of our lives. Ooh, ooh, that's good. Ooh, that's good. So you see, already we're talking about theological issues that have deep weight to them, right? And we haven't even gotten past verse 12 yet. We're halfway through the study time and we haven't even made it past verse 12 yet. You see the depth of Romans here? So Paul is going to this church. He's hearing of their faith and their faith is spoken out throughout the whole known world to go there and impart more spiritual gifts and share in the exercise of those gifts to grow his faith as well. This is the perfect idea of what the church should be in my opinion. That we're sharing our lives and sharing our experiences with God, with each other, and spiritual gifts with each other. And everybody's benefiting. And where does it all lead back to? Back to the gospel message. And Paul states that as we go on. It says that it's the gospel message. All this is about the gospel message. Every gift that is imparted to us should somehow promote the gospel message. That's one of the ways we know that it's of God. It's not for just ourselves. It's to grow the church and impart the gospel message or confirm the gospel message. Either way, the gospel is the center point and the gospel is Jesus. Come on. Good stuff, man. All right, let's try to go on. Verse 13, now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to, barbarian, to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise. So as, as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Jesus came to reveal the Father as his disciples. That is our mission. Amen. So here's Paul stating that he is coming to share in that fruit once again. As he shared in the fruit of all the churches so that we understand that we're not in this alone. There's churches all over the world that we're sharing fruit with. And that's why it states that if one member suffers, we all suffer. But if one member is exalted or one member benefits, we all benefit. So we benefit from God using the church as a whole. From every church that God uses, we all benefit. I am a debtor. Ooh, I like that term. I am a debtor. Why is Paul a debtor? He's a debtor because he sees his response to grace. That he owes it. 
to serve, that he owes it to the Greeks and the barbarians, to the wise and unwise. How was Paul hindered? He was hindered by demonic opposition through governing authorities and through people. And I was going to go to that. I'm glad you brought it up. Paul was hindered. He was also prevented sometimes by the Holy Spirit who wouldn't let him enter certain places. What's this show that Paul was directed and Paul was sensitive to that direction. He didn't make it about him. The Holy Spirit led him into places and led him away from places. And if you look at the book of Acts, how many times was Paul hindered by the Jews or by a certain group of people? And then he went into the next town and they tried to raise up another uprising against Paul. We know that was all demonically empowered to prevent Paul from preaching the gospel and prevent Paul from going to certain places. And so that's, that's how he was hindered. No different than us. We're hindered. Everywhere we turn, there's some sort of blockage trying to prevent us from preaching the gospel and living the gospel. So as much as in me, I'm ready to preach. Oh, he was a debtor. He was a debtor. We have, we have yes, we have a free gift, right? That free gift, even though it was free to us, cost Jesus. In receiving that gift, we need to show our appreciation. We become a debtor to share that gift with other people. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are ambassadors of Christ. We have a job to do. And Paul recognizes that to the Greek and the barbarian. To go out to those who don't know and begin to preach. And as he's stating that, and he's saying now to all those in Rome, I'm coming to preach the gospel. Why? Verse 16 and verse 17, and I'm going to stop probably there for a while. And if we don't go any further, there's so much to discuss. We are in debt to those God is calling us to be a good witness. Amen, Amy. That's exactly what we're here for, to be a good witness to all those who God is calling and that our lives would become an example. We are in debt. Once you receive grace, we mentioned you know, what does grace look like? It looks like that we're in debt to share the gospel with everybody. When God provides the opportunity, I should say that. All right, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and for the Greek. For in it, in what? In the gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, as it is written the just shall live by faith. Whew. i got to tear myself away. got to get to work. I'm going to watch the rest later. God bless. God bless, Debbie. We'll miss you. Here, now here's the reality of this passage. Paul stating and setting up the foundation to share the gospel. And now he delivers in verse 16. Let me share with the gospel to you the gospel because believing the gospel is the power of God to salvation. What is the gospel? The gospel is centered around Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He was sinless. He is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. He died in our place and he was resurrected for our justification meaning that god sees us in sin no more that is the gospel the gospel is we were enemies of god we were destined to a life of wrath which roman uh, romans goes on to state and if we get there today we will if not it might be next week because there's so much to talk about here but the gospel is good news and the good news is god saves those who believe and then he goes on to stay in it, in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The gospel stirs up faith and belief in the gospel not only gives us salvation, but it reveals God's righteousness. God's righteousness is revealed in the gospel message 
And it's revealed through what? The activity of faith by belief. Not by works, not by following the law, but belief in what God has done. When Jesus said it is finished, do we believe that it was finished? Do we believe that? Because if we believe that, then we have salvation and we see God's righteousness in it. If we don't believe that, then righteousness is not going to be centered from faith. It's going to be centered from works. Oh, I can only be righteous by doing righteous works. Ooh, this is deep stuff, man. The just shall live by what? Faith. This is a statement out of Habakkuk. The just shall live by faith. The just shall not live by works. Because if we live by works, then everywhere we fall short, we're condemned. The just shall live by faith in the finished work of Jesus. doesn't mean we don't work. It means that our work comes from faith. Faith to faith, from grace to grace. Ooh, good statement, Amy. Good statement. So, are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you ashamed of Jesus? Jesus said if we denied him before man, he would deny us before our Father in heaven. Are we ashamed of the gospel message? Are we ashamed of our Christian life? Are we ashamed to share? Because the same gospel message that saved us is what's going to save other people, and we need to deliver the message. Now, Faith is the only access that we have to grace. It's not the work, but faith that righteousness is held. Amen, Jeff. Amen. It's faith. It's belief in what Jesus had done. That's where the righteousness of God is revealed. It's not revealed in our in our works, doing things to please God without God. It's belief... It's based in our faith in receiving what Christ has done for us. That's where the gospel message is really centered. What Jesus did for us. Now, here's where I'm going to go. Verse 17, the righteousness of God is revealed from what? Faith to faith. And the just shall live, be, live by faith. Not by works, not by the law but by faith, faith in the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ. This is how powerful this verse is, okay? Uh, there was a man who read this verse in uh, the 1500s, I believe. And as he read this verse, it changed his whole life. The just shall live by faith out of this very passage, even though it's restated out of from the book of Habakkuk, this man read this passage and it so spurred him on that it changed everything. The man's name, Martin Luther. In the church that he was a monk of, they had what they called penance that you had to pay in order to receive a place, in order to receive standing with God. And if you sinned a lot, you can get recovered if you had enough payment for that and it's it was really weighing him down and then he read this verse and it totally changed his mindset and it started what we call the reformation and it started the protestant movement in which most of us are uh are protestants today and that was that our payment our works will not take sin away from us only our faith will and Martin Luther wrote 90 pages, a 90 page thesis statement and nailed it to the uh, door of the church. So our righteousness is by faith and faith alone. Could the greater things that Jesus spoke about doing in John 14 be the Holy Spirit coming to empower us to reveal the Father, empowering us to reveal the Father beyond works? but by the love we are able to show through the fruit of the Spirit. Amy, that's exactly what the greater works are. 
is to reveal everything and it's greater uh, in number two because the Holy Spirit is working those works out in all of us who believe. That's a really good statement. And faith is the access point to all this. This one verse changed the whole known world of Christianity. Look how much it changes our lives if we believe what Jesus Christ has done on the cross then we're free to express our faith without fear without wrath without all those other things and I love what Paul's doing here because he's setting the stage saying look righteousness comes from faith and if you don't believe guess what in verse 18 all the way to the end of this chapter he's saying that the wrath of God is going to be revealed to those who don't believe. Who empowers our belief? It's the Holy Spirit. And the belief that we have in Jesus' finished works accesses the grace of God. And the grace of God empowers us to be obedient. And our obedience reflects more on the grace of God, which not only allows us to continue in grace upon grace, but it leads other people into this process as well. You see God's system at work here? It starts with God. Then he stirs it up in us. And then we respond. And then he stirs it up in us. And then we respond. And then he stirs, us up, stirs it up in us. And we respond. That's exactly this whole process at work. Yes, we have faith. But who started the faith? He did. This is amazing. I like it. It's simple. Trust God knowing he died for us. Believe that he is the deity. Amen. Amen. So the just shall live by faith. Jesus said faith in God is so powerful that mountains will be moved. A continuous circle of love. Amen. Part of, ooh, that's a good one. Part of the revelation of Jesus Christ is the revel. No, not part of. The revelation of Jesus Christ is the revelation of God's love. That is the gospel, is it not? And if I believe God loves me because of what Jesus did for me, then I am empowered for everything. Where I lack power, it's because of my lack of belief in that process. That Jesus Christ is a revelation of love for me. God's love for me. Ooh. Think how true that is. Where I lack power in my life, it's because I lack belief in Jesus Christ and the revelation of God's love for me in his finished work. Wow. Wow. Think how true that is. When I don't believe, when I'm not accessing by faith that revelation that Jesus is the revelation of God's love for me. Wow. It is that simple, isn't it? I, I don't think we're going to move on past this. So, because 18 through the rest is talking about God's wrath upon those who who uh, do not believe, do not have the gospel message. They're not operating by faith. But look at our lives. When we lack power in our lives, when we lack spiritual power, it's a lack of belief. And where there's a lack of belief, we lose the revelation. We don't understand the revelation of God's love for us. Man, that is deep. Told you the book of Romans is deep. If I believe the gospel and I believe in every area of my life, what Jesus has finished on the cross, which shows God's love to me, think of the power that I have in that belief. And now you can see, ooh, I never saw this before. When the guy goes to Jesus and he says, Lord, I believe help my unbelief, now we can see that there's certain, it's almost like uh, compartmentalized. 
We have faith in the overall thing of Jesus Christ, right? But we have compartments in our lives of unbelief and doubt. And where we have unbelief and doubt in there, we lack that power. Ooh, that's exactly how this works. Amen. Good stuff. So, we may believe in the whole picture, but there's certain compartments in our lives that we don't believe. And where we don't believe or we struggle in that belief, we lack power. Yeah, I believe God saved me, but I don't know if I believe he's going to provide tomorrow. Ooh. Or I don't believe that uh, he's going to work me through this situation. Or I don't believe. And when we don't believe, then guess what? We limit that power. We limit his working. We limit his love. Ooh. Where we don't believe, we limit God's love. Where we don't believe, we limit it, his love to other people. Man. If I don't believe God's in control, then I limit his possibilities in my life and other people's lives. How do we give over those areas in life? I would say that we have to first recognize them and then we conscious, consciously need to submit them to him and ask him for the ability to believe what he says about them. Every year God peels off layers of unbelief, works in me to filter out everything in me that isn't living for his glory from grave to life, grace to grace, with faith and more faith, fully surrendered. You guys are getting it. So think about it. In those areas in our life that we haven't surrendered to God, it's because of unbelief. We have to recognize it, and then we have to ask him for it, and then we have to believe what he says about it. Ooh. So there's a whole cycle. Recognizing it, Submitting, believing, and doing. And that'll help us get through it. That'll help us get through it. Also, talking about it with other believers will help us get through it because we'll realize, or they'll help us realize through sometimes their own experiences where we are lacking in faith. Lay it upon his feet. He will take care of it. Just trust and believe. Amen. So there's a way that thinks, there's a way of a man um, that seems right, but the end is death. But there's a way that doesn't seem right and the end is life. How much of the, our mentality um, seems right, but isn't right? And then we don't even realize it until we're exposed to the truth. And then exposure to the truth causes conviction, which causes the desire to change. But then going to God with that conviction, he gives us the power to change. And then we can overcome it. Once again, being with other believers and fellowshipping and constantly going through the word brings us the revelation of our lack of faith, which should cause conviction which causes us to go to God and he gives us the power to change. And if we have other believers around that's praying for us, their support helps us in the power to change. Fellowship. Once again, though, God's love is the motivator and the gospel and belief in the finished work of Christ reveals God's love. So now we can change because of God's love. God expose the lies that we're believing and replace it with truth. Oh, truth, truth exposes the problem so that we can, oh, we can put the medicine of God's love on it. Man. Fellowship, whether we are together or online, it's true. It's true. 
Think of what God can do in all this. When we allow our faith to be stirred up, like Paul did here in Romans, when he was sharing his, the gifts and they were sharing the fruit, it was building Paul up in the faith. Wow. Holy Spirit is that wrapped up in one with God. Amen. And he's here even right now as we're talking to see that God's desire for us to change and um, believe, because of belief and causing us to grow in our faith is the revelation of his love. Man, that is deep stuff. God's desire for us to change and grow in our belief is the revelation of his love. That is deep. And Paul, let's go back in the context of the scripture. Paul's writing to the Romans to let them know that they can be so much more as they get together and they share in the gifts and they share in the fruit and they build up each other's faith. Give us the desire to have more of him. Amen. Come on. Think about that. That's what the church should be. And this is the whole context of Romans. Here, let me tell you what faith stirs up. Let me tell you what the gospel stirs up. And then, after that, he shows the reality of what life is like without the gospel. Without belief in the gospel, I should say. Romans is so good. And then he goes on, as we'll learn next week, and I'm holding it back for a reason, because there's so much there. But as we look at next week, we'll see the reality of um, denial of the gospel, lack of belief in the truth, lack of belief in Jesus Christ. You don't get the revelation of God's love. You get the revelation of God's wrath. Wow. Wow. And God loves us so much that he's painting the picture so that we would see his reality so that he can be a greater part of our life. Wow. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. All right, guys. Um, I'm not going to go any further in Romans because uh, the next verses are kind of about the same topic, which I believe we can discuss a lot better in detail next week um but if you have any other comments we have just a couple minutes for comments or questions we'll take those before we pray out comments or questions we'll take those before we pray out is the church church but we are it is the church but we are fighting a principality of evil recognizing jesus and staying firm on his promises amen the greater we grow in belief, greater we grow in faith, the more sensitive we will become to those areas of our life where we lack it. And we also, in those areas of life where we lack faith, will understand there's a principality there trying to keep us away from belief. Because he has access to those areas of our life where we don't believe. Ooh. Wow. I'm glad this is online. This is some good stuff, man. I might have to start bringing a, a notebook to write down these notes because there's, man, that's powerful. Where we don't believe, we give him access. Where we do believe God, we access grace. Ooh. I could even title sermon Access. We're either accessing God or the enemy is accessing us. All right, guys, uh, we're going to go ahead and close in prayer. Thanks for joining. Uh, once again, uh, Mike Packey will be here at 9 for uh, Digging Deeper. Uh, they're going to be doing some questions and answers as well. And it's also in person. Uh, if you would like to tithe online, um, please go to the website at livinghopeanza.com. Go to the donate section and follow through, and uh, you can submit that online. Also, if you would like to uh, 
share if you have a prayer request to share go to the prayer section of our website you can share that and we just would love to um we would love to help each other grow by the use of gifts by the sharing of mutual fruit and if you're out there and you don't really have a, a church home you can be a part of our family anytime by watching and sharing and and helping us in produce fruit and share in that fruit. God bless and Father, we thank you so much that you're doing more than we can imagine. That your love for us is so deep, so vast that we can never comprehend it. And we want to release our unbelief to you. Help us truly see the completion of the gospel in Jesus Christ and how you finish the work so that we can live in the freedom of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless, guys. Thank you.